Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will withhold, I will uphold you with my righteousness, with my right, right, right hand. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans for you, to, for you declares the Lord's plan, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to plan to give you hope and a future. In 2020, an estimated 276, 400,480 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women and 2,670 cases in men. Approximately 42,170 women will pass away in 2020 and 500 men will pass away in 2020 from breast cancer. If y'all will bow your heads. God, please take each one of who has battled breast cancer and wrap your arms around each of them. Continue to heal them and make them feel healthy again. God, we ask that you touch each and each one here who has lost a loved one or someone who has has been dealing with breast cancer. Comfort them in these times. Give them the strength that they need through the t through this tough battle they are going through. Bless each and every one of them. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Please rise and turn in your head books to hymn number 362. <laughs> house. It is good to be together. It is good to be able to gather in fellowship and worship together this morning. We do want to welcome our guests. If you're visiting, would you raise your hand? Any visitors? See a couple of folks. Good to have each one here. We thank the Lord for the time that we have to gather together. I uh, want to thank the, the ladies for doing our call to worship this morning and reminding us that uh, as I look out and I see all the pink, we're wearing pink today. To remember those who are suffering from breast cancer and to celebrate the accomplishments uh, from the research and just pray that it will continue to proceed. So again, today we remember those who are, are suffering and those who are working with those who are suffering from breast cancer. Uh, a few announcements I want to share quickly. First of all, following the worship this morning, don't forget there's a book club meeting for those who are members of the book club. Please plan to stay for that. Also at two o'clock, we have our trunk or treat. And uh, the weather is not looking like it's gonna cooperate very well, but I uh, understand rain or shine, uh, there is a plan. And so if you have uh, committed and intend to, to bring your vehicle and open your trunk, 
Uh, they have a plan to, to make that successful and hopefully uh, keep uh, the treaters and the treaties or those who are coming, uh, keep them from getting too wet out there. But uh, we'll, we'll plan to, to go ahead, uh, rain or shine, and I don't think the shine is very likely. Uh, but again, that's at two o'clock. And so please, uh, uh, if you're planning to set up and we need to have you set up before two o'clock because two o'clock is when we've advertised that kids will be showing up. So we can't have cars moving around at two o'clock. We'd like to, I guess, have things set up by about a quarter or 10 minutes before two so that when the kids show up. Not sure who to look at to, for confirmation on that, but just plan to, to be set up by about quarter till two if you're planning to come and to, uh, to provide treats for the kids. Uh, other activities this week, again, don't forget our Bible studies on uh, Wednesday morning, the Bible study out of town and country. In the evening uh, on Wednesday, the Bible study here in the social hall at the church. And then Thursday evening, uh, there is the online Bible study for those who uh, are able to participate in that. That's another great opportunity as the pastor continues the study in First Peter. Uh, next Sunday, I want to remind you there is a board meeting. So board members, please uh, plan on that. Uh, again, that will be, will be Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Then the following Sunday, two weeks from today, we will have our last concert. Our concerts have been a little bit sparse this year, but we continue to, to try to have them. And Lord willing, we will be having one in two weeks and Lori Bodkin will be here uh, to, to present that for us. So we look forward to that. I wanna bring your attention to the note about Veterans Day. If you uh, have the names of veterans in the branch of service, uh, that you'd like to remember or recognize members of your family, neighbors, community members uh, that you'd like to have mentioned. Uh, please provide that to uh, Donna uh, by November the 4th. Ideally, uh, if you can have it by next Sunday would be, be great, but certainly before November the 4th. And uh, notice the email address there or the phone number if you want to, uh, to reach out that way, or you can obviously write it out and hand it to her personally. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is coming up. November the 22nd is when we need to have all the gifts in for that. Uh, Angelique has boxes available. Uh, if you'd like to, to get a box uh, to put your gift in, uh, that's the standard box size and so it's good. I think we have plenty of boxes. Uh, so if you wanna get a box from her, that's great. Uh, get the flyer that has the information on what is is acceptable and what's not acceptable to go in that gift box because there's certain things that either won't survive the the trip things like chocolates that could melt uh, no child wants to receive a box with melted chocolates in it uh, or some toys and so forth are not appropriate in certain countries and so be sure to uh, be aware of what is and what is not acceptable to go in your box uh, so again, we need to have those back by the 22nd. I want to share at this time, uh, I've been a little negligent in getting this done in a timely fashion, but October's not over yet. So uh, we do want to remember that October is Pastor Appreciation uh, Month. And so I guess, first of all, let's give our pastor and his family, because they work with him, a hand showing their, our appreciation to them. And along with that, uh, we will be taking an offering today uh, for the pastor and his family. Again, an appreciation offering to share with them. And as a special bonus, the National Association of Evangelicals, uh, if we take an offering and we report to them that we did an offering, they have an additional gift that they will send to uh, the pastor and his family. Uh, it, it's a monetary gift. Uh, they'll get a gift card uh, that will be sent directly to them. And so we do want to be sure to take that offering to show our appreciation. And then we want to be sure that they benefit from that additional gift from the National Association of Evangelicals. So I would ask that at the end of the service, we can have a couple of the ushers 
at the door to take an offering as, as we go out. Um, there's Bobby, he's on the wrong side. I was looking over here, where's Bobby? Bobby, can we be sure that we have an offering plate back there as we go out this morning? Thank you. You confused me. I can't got to keep up with you. No, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, are there other announcements anyone would like to share at this time? Yes, yes ma'am. As she's coming, I just want to share too. Uh, in your bulletin is 50 creative ways to bless your pastor. So this is something too that in addition to what we're doing today, if you see something there that you think, wow, I can do that, uh, or I'd like to do that, or if you have other ways that you want to express your appreciation, I know it would be appreciated. That's Barbara. That's what last Sunday I said to you all about our left hand officers. And then each of your bulletin you had a bright yellow paper that gave you information. Today I'm going to pass around a board, and on it it has areas of which you can serve the church and the Lord. I've also placed the, the yellow paper in here again if you have questions. My request to you, when you get a hold of it, don't just shift it on. Sit there and meditate and say, what can I do for you, Lord? We have a whole sheet of things that you can do for you, Lord. So this is what we have during the service. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And we do encourage you, if you would like to, to serve, uh, don't look at that and say, well, so-and-so's done that for years. Well, maybe so-and-so would like a break. And if you're willing to serve, you can offer them a break. So don't, don't look at it as, uh, you know, I can't do as well as so-and-so. Uh, we all have gifts to share, and this is an opportunity for you to be a blessing to your church uh, by sharing. Thank you, Barbara. Any other announcements? Um, just a clarification and a reminder. Um, we're looking for veterans' names for the Veterans Day service. Um, sometimes I think we forget Memorial Day is for those who have passed and are dead. And Veterans Day is for those who are alive. So when you're giving names for veterans, uh, give Donna the names of people that have served that are still living. Uh, that way we can differentiate between the two holidays and not mix the two together by accident. Anyone else? Very good. Let's take a moment or two and we'll uh, greet one another as we prepare for our chorus. Oh, 
trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands as you go out with joy. We shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will pray for me, for you there we shout to joy. And all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of being in your house again this morning. We would ask that you would bless everyone here. Bless those who have the gift. Bless those who do not. You just bless those who are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and leave them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee. Keep out the children and the baptism. Pray us this in Jesus' name. Amen. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I, I shall know him, I shall know. And redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hands. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful hymn. Thank you, Will. Um, couple of things to bring to your attention. Um, anybody that has a box has one of these. They, there may have been a couple of left over. Um, if, you're, if you don't have a box and you would like one, just let me know. Um, this is the uh, global, UB Global Worldview paper. Um, this is our uh, missions report for the denomination. And you'll notice here on the first page is about the community center in Thailand. Um, our church um, contributed quite a, a bit of money towards it, uh, about $10,000, which was almost one fifth of what they were asking from the entire denomination. It represents to me, it represents an evidence and a miracle of God's moving in our church uh, to the extent that the missions director called me and wanted me to verify whether we had reported accurately. He didn't expect such a gift from a small church out in the mountains of 
Virginia. So um, I encourage you to read the report because we invested quite a bit into this. Okay, so you have it in your box. Uh, don't just take it and lay it down somewhere because I think it's important for you to know how your mission's money is being spent. Um, another thing was that one of the announcements in the bulletin, uh, Jeremy Turner has uh, wood that's available for someone to cut if they need it for heat. Um, of course, he's especially interested if somebody that is in need uh, would be interested in accessing it. Uh, and if there's people in the church that want to cut it and then want to, uh, want to get it to a needy person that possibly can't cut the wood for themselves, uh, just let Richard know. Richard, wave your hand in case there's people here that don't know who you are. And uh, let Richard know. Uh, Jeremy's not here today attending. He was here last week, though. Um, so anyways, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, Billy Cody, his uh, mom had uh, hernia surgery this week. And uh, this morning, she became septic. And so uh, Billy and the family were on their way to church and they had to turn uh, direction for their day to go back down to UVA and, and uh, be with his mom. So uh, we're, we trust that the doctors will find the cause of it. We trust that the doctors will take care of it, but uh, his mother's name is Debbie and we need to remember Debbie in our prayers, okay? Um, trying to think if there's uh, anything else that has cropped up this week per se. Uh, do you know of anything, Donna? I've... Right, right. There was one that was for the prayer chain, but not the prayer list. Um, I have a note from Paula. So let me read that before we open the floor for uh, requests and updates. Okay, let's see here. Paula says, greetings, church family. You have no idea how much I long to be with you. I miss the songs, the prayer time, and when we praise God over answered prayer, carry each other's burdens and lay them at Christ's feet. But I most especially miss the fellowship of being with you. On Tuesday of this week, Alan accompanied me to my doctor's appointment. He seemed pleased with the progress of my wounds and allowed me to start taking my antibiotics by mouth instead of by pick line. As long as I am able to swallow horse pills, this is a major praise since I previously spent nine to 10 hours every day attached to the pick line. Also on Tuesday, the visitation restrictions were modified and I'm able to have visitors. I can't begin to tell you how much it meant to be able to see my parents and my children this week as well as being able to fellowship with Pastor Scott and Donna. My therapy is progressing well, and I was able to stand from my wheelchair to the walker multiple times under my own power with minimal support on Thursday. I was able to hold myself up for 21 seconds. I keep gaining. Please continue to pray for me this coming week as I visit the plastic surgeon and receive an update on my right ankle. God continues to strengthen me through your prayers. Thank you so very much. Glad to hear from Paula every week and get the updates that she gives. Um, and uh, just, I don't know if this is a big deal or not, it is to my family, but this Sunday marks uh, six years, the completion of six years since we first arrived, so time has sure flown. It sure has flown, but uh, we're grateful to the Lord uh, to have been here for six years in pastoring. Uh, just a tremendous community, a tremendous church, and uh, just uh, making friends and, and uh, sensing God's hand in everything. We're so glad. Are there any uh, other prayer requests or any updates? Uh, Esther? I have a couple from Jason. Um, his grandmother, has, I don't remember what the surgery is, but yes, there's some kind of surgery, and her bones are getting very thinned out. She 
she can't get out of the which was her result of cancellation of family holidays this year. So that's kind of hard on the family, but also we can pray she can be staying healthy to get the work she's done. He also informed me his father's schedule with UVA got screwed up, and he may not get his knees done until the end of the year, possibly not until next year. Um, so he's really struggling with that. So just please be back in prayer as well. Okay. Davis's is... Uh, grandmother is getting a surgery and needs our prayers. And his dad may not get his knee surgery for a while. So we have to keep that in our prayers as well. Anything else? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the, on election day. Yeah. Where there, there's going to be a prayer vigil here at the church on election day. Uh, that's going to start at 6 a.m. It's going to go all the way to 9 p.m. Uh, you know, not everybody, you know, can stay for an entire 15 hours, but um, it's open because we want people to come and pray. You spend however much time you feel like you can spend in prayer, but there will be uh, public prayer, private prayer. Uh, you know, maybe some Bible readings or or something as the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, but this particular year, I think, has been extremely hard on all of us. And I think that this election day uh, certainly warrants this kind of a, a, of a vigil. So um, I will be here from 6 a.m., to 9 p.m. Uh, taking a break to go and vote other than that. Um, but uh, keep that in mind, please. Uh, pray for the prayer vigil because if the Holy Spirit is not present at the prayer vigil, then it's just gonna be nothing but an exercise. And there's no point in a 15 hour exercise that bears no fruit. So anything else? Uh, yes, Alan? Okay, Alan's brother-in-law has surgery and he's on the men now. Praise the Lord for that. Anything else? Uh, Fred. Okay. The other thing is, I had my uncle put on there and had three stents. Um, he's going great. Um, no problems since then. And the last thing, uh, my dad's been in and out trying to get tests done, um, see what's going on, why he's got um, problems in his chest area with the pressure and stuff like that. The only thing that they've been able to find was they found one small vessel that was at 99 percent block. So Carol Shobe uh, is stopping her treatments and uh, we want to keep her in our prayers. And uh, Fred's uncle is doing well after the stints and his 
dad is experiencing some relief and we're continuing to pray for God's healing. And uh, he said that he felt that the Lord had assured him in the middle of the night that he was going to get healed. We will agree with him in prayer on that. That's for sure. Um, I think I saw another hand when Fred was up. Yes, Angelique. Yeah. Okay. And what was the name? Parker. 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 Okay. I thought you said Carl, and I couldn't figure out who Carl was. Okay. Parker fell out of the tree and hurt his elbow. So let's keep him in our prayers. Um, yeah, I saw another hand behind. Was it Mary or? Oh, oh, Mona back there. Okay. Oh. Okay, Mona's aunt passed away yesterday. You keep her family in your prayers. Anything else? Ellen? Okay, Paul's address in your bulletin, make sure room 80 is what you put there. I'm sure they'd figure out how to get it to her anyways, but anything else? Okay, not seeing any other hands waving around, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your kindnesses to us every day. Lord, we all the time, uh, I think we think about ourselves, we think about what we need, what we want, um, and it's probably natural for that, Lord, but we want to glorify you because, Lord, your son Jesus has brought us from death to life. And I thank you, God, for all of the medical help that you give people. You, you touch their lives. You give them doctors. You give them the ability to, to take care of the medical end of life. And, and, and you also have been with people and helped them, Lord, with their finances. You've given them relief. I pray, Father, you would be with a couple this week that are struggling financially and and I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are struggling medically right now for those, Lord, who aren't sure what the future holds and whether they will die or whether they will recover. But I pray, God, your hand on them for your guidance and for your peace to be with them. I pray, Father, for uh, those that are in the hospital now. I pray, Lord, for those that have appointments and I ask, God, your hand on them. Be with those, Lord, that are struggling with relationship issues and need wisdom. God, without that wisdom, what would they do? For our man's wisdom accomplishes little, but God's wisdom accomplishes much. And I pray, Father, you would be with those that are in the emergency services. And I pray, Lord, you would be with those that are in the military. Help them to finish their job and to come home safely. Be with those that are on the mission field. We thank you, Lord, for what we saw in the, uh, in the missions paper about the community center that we contributed to in Thailand. And we ask, God, your hand on them as they continue to use that for your glory. I pray, Father, that as we come upon the election and as the uh, day of election approaches, that you would uh, be with us as we seek to uh, to uh, come into your presence and, and to lift up our country and revival and so many other good things to you in prayer. For Lord, without you, uh, many things may be lost. Now we ask Lord your hand on us as we turn our attention to your word in Jesus name. Okay, um, there's a couple of things about the sermon this morning that I need to say before we actually get started. And one is that there is probably about three or four years worth of messages in this passage that I've selected today. 
And I selected the passage though, because that's the way the Lord led. And I have just have felt that the Lord wanted me to focus on the subject of obedience, not on the many, many different uh, aspects of Christ or the many aspects of, um, of the church that are touched on even briefly in this. So some of the things I'm probably going to glance over and you're going to say, well, my goodness, I would like to have heard more on that subject. Uh, that would probably be though for another message, okay? Uh, if you do have questions, if the scripture brings up questions, I'm always happy to talk to you um, out of the pulpit, of course because this is one of my favorite things to do is to discuss the gospel with other people. But uh, let's take a look at the book of Revelation now. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapter one and picking up at verse nine. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool and white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hell. Write therefore what you have seen what is now and what will take place later. The command is a command to write down what he sees. Now, you may say to yourself, well, what's the big deal? Okay, well, part of the big deal is that the command is holy. Now, when you're dealing with a holy God, you are not dealing with men. Men are very gracious. They're very forgiving when they agree with you. Men are very, uh, they, they, they lack mercy and they lack suffrage whenever they disagree with you, okay? So when you're dealing with men, you are either speaking to the group of people that agree with you or you are speaking against a group of people that disagree with you. When you are speaking on behalf of God, you are speaking a truth that belongs neither to those that agree with you, nor to those that disagree with you. You are speaking a truth that is other than every truth known to man. And when I say truth known to men, I am speaking philosophically here. Okay, every man has something, a system, some way of looking at the world that they believe is true. But the only truth, really, the only real truth is holy truth that comes from Christ. 
And this means that uh, summing up, paraphrasing, equivocation, none of these are permitted. So when he is writing, when John is writing, he cannot just sum up what he is seeing and give you the gist of it. He cannot paraphrase a single word that he hears and give you an explanation of what was said rather than giving you the very words that he hears. He doesn't have that leeway. He does not have the leeway to equivocate. And you say, what does equivocation mean? It means that you saw something or you heard something, but because you don't think people will understand it, you give them instead something you think they will understand that will give them kind of the idea of what it was that you experienced. Now, all of our politics, all of our writings, all of our books, all of our histories, all of our textbooks are all summations, paraphrases, or equivocations designed to help people that do not understand complicated communication so that they might somehow get the gist of what it is you're trying to say. There is no history book that covers both the good and the bad unless it is just to touch upon it. But the Bible, on the other hand, does not seek to give you the gist it must give you the exact things that were said and done because it is a holy writing, which means that you cannot add to it or take from it. Deuteronomy 4.2, be careful to do all I have commanded you, swerving neither to the right nor to the left. Exodus 20.25, 20, when you build an altar out of stone, do not lay a chisel to it or you will corrupt it. Ezekiel 13, one to three. Cursed are those prophets which prophesy out of their imagination saying the Lord has said when I have not said. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. If anyone adds to this book of prophecy, God will add to him the curses of this prophecy. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his place in the kingdom. Do you see how strict the scripture is when dealing with holy things? And yet, how many of us will take this Bible, open it up, and instead of praying before we read it, just open it up and hope we'll find something that'll make us feel good. This is, we used to always say, and it says it here on my spine here, Holy Bible. That does not mean special religious Bible. It means a word from God that if it is interfered with in any way, you have violated its holy nature. Any pastor that gets up in the pulpit with this kind of pressure on him and makes a bunch of jokes from the pulpit and then throws a little point out with a little wink and a nod at his congregation, feeling that he has entertained them well and then goes home, has no business in the pulpit. He should go to an open mic night. And he should leave the pulpit alone. And you say, well, that's just your opinion. No, it's the opinion of the scripture. I'm telling you, he is better off. If he causes one of these children to stumble, he's better off than a millstone were tied around his neck 
and that he were thrown into the deepest sea. This is dreadful that God has asked John to write something that he's about to see, which few of us even still to this day can grasp. When you and I set out to be Christians and obey God, it is not simply just try and be as moral as you can because we know that no man can be moral. It's not just simply try to be as holy as you can because it's not just going to church. It's not just, it's, it's not just reading your Bible or praying even. It has nothing to do with the particulars. It's all about Jesus Christ. And if you do not approach Christ with some degree of trembling, if you, if you don't open this Bible and beg God, please help me. Because if you don't, I'm going to add my thoughts to this. And I'm going to subject this to my experience. And my experience will teach the Bible instead of my Bible teaching my experience. If you don't have enough care to even do that, then you have no idea why John reacted the way that he did. Here at the opening of Revelation, you have no concept. Here's another problem that he faces. Mistake and error are the realm of the flesh, which no man can escape. You cannot escape your flesh. You have to live in it. You have to. You have to deal with a mind, a soul, and a body that were trained by the sinful nature. They are not in themselves the sinful nature. I think that must be said. In Isaiah 6, 5 to 6, Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I've seen the holiness of God and an angel flies to the altar and grabs a coal from the altar and touches his lips. And he says, your lips have been cleansed. Why? Because the holiness of God has touched him. He has chosen to speak what is holy rather than choosing to speak out of his own imagination. Romans 7, 14 through 20. And I think this bears reading. So we're going to go to it and I'm not going to give it to you from my memory only. Starting at verse 14 and uh, continuing down then through uh, verse 20. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do. But what I hate, that's what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my flesh. Now, if you have the NIV, it says sinful nature. That's a bad interpretation. The King James says the flesh. That is good. Okay? Because your flesh, and as I said earlier, your mind, your body, and your soul are trained by the sinful nature, but they are not themselves the sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I which do it, 
but it is sin living in my members that does it, okay? So let's keep that in mind, what we just read. How inescapable the flesh is. If the Holy Spirit does not guide you while you are reading the Bible, you will use your flesh to understand it. And by using your flesh to understand it, you will corrupt it. And having corrupted it, you will put a corrupt message into your heart. And having put a corrupt message in your heart, it will corrupt your behavior, your actions, and your responses. Do you understand how desperate this obedience is? This is devastating that you should be asked to obey God and to not swerve to the right or to the left. It is devastating. And if this does not bring dread into your heart, the idea of just reading the Bible, imagine what it did to John who had to write part of it and the other writers. They did not write out of out of gleeful, foolish, childish behavior. The scripture says that they wrote as the Holy Spirit carried them along. Ecclesiastes 7.20 tells us there's not a righteous man in all the earth who always does what is right and never sins. You understand this. Write down what you see, God says to John. And John realizes he can't sum it up. He can't paraphrase it. He can't equivocate. He has to be exact. Which means that because his flesh is given to summing up, paraphrasing, and equivocating, he is at a loss. He is not going to be able to write this down. And he's not going to be able to fulfill the commandment. And he's not going to be able to do what is holy. Thus. John fell at Christ's feet as though dead. Now, the way that it's worded here in the scripture is intentional. He does not want you to think he fell down at Jesus' feet to worship. The phrase falling down at his feet is often used for worship. He wants you to know that realizing that he was about to write something holy and that knowing who he is as a man, he collapsed. And anybody looking on would assume he had died on the spot. But here is the good news. And that is that Christ reached out with his right hand and helped him out. Now, why the right hand? Why did, why did he even say which hand? Who cares, right? Left hand, right hand, who cares? Because the right hand is always used as the hand of power in all of the gospel, in all of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. It is by God's right hand that he upholds me. And here it is the right hand that touches John. This is to say that God gave John the power to stand. Now think about this. You open your Bible and you, po you, you flop it open to the middle, take your finger and pop it out and God help me to find a verse today because I'm in a big hurry and I don't have time for you. John falls at his feet as though dead. We don't even have the decency to tremble before we even open this Bible. God's Bible is holy. To be a writer of this revelation is devastating. It's dreadful. And the scripture portion that we have today opens with the command and closes with the command. And in between, we have some understanding of Christ through an illustration. This illustrated Christ 
we see has first of all, a voice like a trumpet and rushing waters. We have these examples in the Old Testament so that we understand that this is the true Christ because the Old Testament upholds this witness. Exodus 20, 18, God speaks the 10 commandments to all the people from the mountain. And afterward, his voice, it said, sounds like a trumpet. And when they hear the trumpet blast, they are so afraid that they back away from God. Why are they afraid? Because they're being confronted with holiness. And they know that they're not holy. And they don't want to touch what's holy because it is frightening to be around a holy God. It is frightening to open a holy Bible. It is frightening to deal with his holy word. And if you do not have the fear of God in you, that this, these things don't matter and that you think that I'm some kind of a doddering fool to say these things to you, please examine your relationship with God, please. Because you should all have a healthy fear of God. You should all have a healthy fear of approaching a holy God. These did in the Old Testament, John does in the New Testament. And we see in Ezekiel 1, 24 through 2, 1. And I want to read that directly to you as well. So we're turning back to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And we're coming up to uh, chapter 1. So that should be fairly easy if you can find Ezekiel. And now picking up at verse 24. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of the army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above, the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire and that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. Here in both cases, we see in Ezekiel's case and John's case, they both fall down. Now John says, as though dead, Ezekiel gives us the impression it was to worship. God tells Ezekiel to stand up. God gives his right hand to John that he may stand up. This voice of God's is frightening. You know, you say to yourself, well, why doesn't God talk to us in an audible voice anymore? Because it would freak you out in a way that you don't even, you've never been freaked out like that. He has a regal robe and white hair indicating supreme authority. Help if I pulled that up, wouldn't it? And divine wisdom. In Daniel 7, 9, Ezekiel, Daniel is next. In Daniel 7, 9, we read this, 
As I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. And so we see this description also in the Old Testament in Job chapter 12 and verse 12. We see this is not wisdom found among the aged does not long life bring understanding. And so we see here that the white hair of Jesus is to indicate his wisdom. That he has he has in his hands the wisdom of the ages. He is every man has gray hair to some degree. Some have white hair. But the brilliance of the whiteness of Christ's hair indicates his wisdom is for the ages. It will never, ever wear out. It is not a wisdom that falls out of use later on. Eyes that blaze like fire. This indicates judgment. This is the eyes of Christ peering into your soul, cutting through all of the malarkey, cutting through all of your pretenses, cutting through your mask, your walls, and peering right into your soul, uncovering the ugliness that is there and reviving and reassuring that which is holy and good in his sight. To have good judgment as God counts judgment is a tremendous gift. You want these eyes to burn into your soul. You want them to show you who you really are. By doing so, he will free you of your sin by helping you to see the difference between what you think is good and what he thinks is good. Between what you're willing to accept and what he refuses to accept. These eyes are amazing. You need him to peer into your soul. The next is feet like burnished bronze, carrying the perfect message. These feet, the Bible says this in Isaiah 52, 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him that brings good news. Wherever we are hearing about legs or feet in the scripture, it has to do with a messenger. The angels that surround the throne in Isaiah's vision have bronze legs and feet. When David is awaiting to hear what has happened with Absalom, he is judging the quality of the messenger based upon how well they are running. The feet that are bringing to him news of his own son and what has happened in the battle. All the time, feet are associated with the bringing of a message. The bronze feet of Christ indicate he doesn't just carry a message, he carries the perfect message. There is no fault in the revelation that we are about to read is what is indicated by what John writes regarding what he sees. The next thing we see is a sharp double-edged sword in Christ's mouth. This is a word that divides truth rightly. 
As it says in Hebrews 4, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to soul and spirit, joints and marrow. When Jesus speaks, it exposes everything that is false. It can even help you discern between your spirit and your soul, which most people do not know the difference between. And if you were to ask me how to explain it, I would say read the Bible for a while and you will understand. But how do I explain it? I can use words and I can say your soul is part of the flesh. The spirit comes from God, but that's not going to help you really to discern between the two. Only the word of God can help you discern between the two. Only this sharp double-edged sword will help you to divide the difference between your soul and your spirit. To know whether you are listening to your feelings and experiences or whether you are listening to the holy God. And last of all, we have a face Shining like the sun, all glory is on Christ. We see Christ's face transfigured in Matthew 17, too. It describes it in much the same way. But here in Revelation, God does not hold back at all. I have, as a boy, tried to look at the sun wanted to see if I could. I found it to be utterly impossible. To glance at it for a moment, yes. To watch it any length of time, painful. Imagine now that Christ's face is in close proximity to John and it shines like the sun. The glory of God is so powerful. Now, again, Christ reaches out his right hand and he reminds him of some things to strengthen him because John has seen this illustrated Christ. John has been commanded to write a holy message and he is filled with dread because of this, because he knows he must obey, but he knows that if he strays even a bit, why he could corrupt everything that is in front of him in the message that he gives. And so Jesus reminds him, I am the author of life. I'm the first and the last. According to the scriptures, we know that before creation, Jesus wrote everything. God wrote everything in books. Before one of them came to be, he wrote all down. And therefore, nothing surprises him. So Jesus was not unprepared for John to see him in this way. Nor was he unprepared to ask John to write and so this is the grace of God. This grace also is extended to you to remind you the problems that you're facing right now that cause you to tremble. God already knew they were going to happen. Put your faith in him. Pray. Seek him out. Seek out his wisdom. He already has a plan as to how to handle it. Also, he's the one who died and was resurrected. This is to remind John that even if the task at hand should kill John, Christ has the power of resurrection in his hand. There are times when you are going to be following God and obeying him that you may think it will be your death. You may be right. But you must be reminded that the grace of God extended to you says to you simply this, he died and was raised again. If you die, he can raise you 
to. And then last of all, he's the one who holds the keys of hell and death. I want you to understand there is a bad theology going around there that says that he took the keys of death and hell from Satan. Satan never, ever had these keys. They belong to God the Father. God the Father is going to cast Satan into what the Bible says, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It does not say he's going to cast them into Satan's realm. This is not Satan's realm. In fact, the lake of fire is in the presence of the Lamb. This is what the scripture says. The lake of fire is a holy place designed to execute judgment on those who have offended God eternally. The keys of death and hell were the father's. He gave them to the son. This is the grace of Christ at work, that he is the author of life, that he has died and has risen again. He's already been there and done that. He has the t-shirt, so to speak. I don't mean to diminish that. Please forgive me. But then last of all, that he has the keys of death and hell. He has the right to put to hell who he chooses, to put to life who he chooses. When you are confronted with obeying Christ, you are going to think to yourself, how in the world, how in the world am I going to do this? You will do it by the right hand of God who will give you his power. He will give you his power to read the Bible. He will give you his power to obey him. He will give you his power for all areas of life. Your whole life can be a miracle or your whole life can be nothing but missed, and missed opportunities with God. Because in the end, what you've done for God is all that will remain. Let's pray. Father, this message is both encouraging and to the flesh discouraging. For the flesh was hoping that we would have a, an awfully nice sermon today. One that would make us feel better so that we could stop seeking the Lord. But the flesh is the enemy of the spirit, is it not, Lord? And therefore, if the spirit is going to win, the flesh must lose. And so, God, I pray that you would help that to be the reality in our daily life. Now, take the word and do with it what you chose when you initiated it. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just sing maybe one verse of the hymn before we have prayer. Please turn your hymn books to hymn number 40. We will sing the first verse.
Father God, so often we take it so lightly that we can come to you with our prayers and have an audience with you. We can open your word and read the message that you have for us. We have access to you through Jesus. What an awesome, awesome thing, Lord, that we take so lightly. We don't really think about what that means. If we had the opportunity to sit with and to speak with the President of the United States, what a great honor we would see that as being. But yet, when we have the opportunity to sit before you, to speak with you, we take it so lightly. Forgive us, Father. We thank you and praise you that you are always there hearing us and wanting us to share our inmost thoughts, our inmost concerns. You know them before we share. We take so lightly that we can open your word and study your word and read the message. So many tell us that it's a message of old, it's a good story, but it has little application for today. But truly, Lord, we know that your word is instruction for us. It is endless, it is timeless. It is as good today, if not better, than the day it was originally written down by your authors who wrote it down for us. Thank you, Lord, for being a wonderful, loving, caring God. Thank you for giving us access through Jesus to be able to come to you to seek your direction, to seek your word and to seek the opportunity to seek your forgiveness when we fail you. Thank you, Lord, for this message today. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and to hear your word truly spoken as it ought. Bless us now as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh